Chapter 1, The Drama of the Gifted Child and the Psychoanalyst's Narcissistic Disturbance Introduction Experience has taught us that we have only one enduring weapon in our struggle against mental illness, the emotional discovery and emotional acceptance of the truth in the individual and unique history of our childhood. Is it possible then, with the help of psychoanalysis, to free ourselves altogether from illusions? History demonstrates that they sneak in everywhere, that every life is full of them, perhaps because the truth often would be unbearable. And yet, for many people, the truth is so essential that they must pay dearly for its loss with grave illness. On the path of analysis, we try in a long process to discover our own personal truth. This truth always causes much pain before giving us a new sphere of freedom, unless we content ourselves with already conceptualized intellectual wisdom based on other people's painful experiences, for example that of Sigmund Freud. But then we shall remain in the sphere of illusion and self-deception. There is one taboo that has withstood all the recent efforts at demystification, the idealization of mother love. The usual run of biographies illustrates this very clearly. In reading the biographies of famous artists, for example, one gains the impression that their lives began at puberty. Before that, we are told, they had a happy, contented, or untroubled childhood, or one that was full of deprivation or very stimulating. But what a particular childhood really was like does not seem to interest these biographers, as if the roots of a whole life were not hidden and entwined in its childhood. I should like to illustrate this with a simple example. Henry Moore describes in his memoirs how, as a small boy, he massaged his mother's back with an oil to soothe her rheumatism. Reading this suddenly threw light for me on Moore's sculptures, the great reclining women with their tiny heads. I now could see in them the mother through the small boy's eyes, with a head high above, in diminishing perspective, and the back close before him and enormously enlarged. This may be irrelevant for many art critics, but for me it demonstrates how strongly a child's experiences may endure in his unconscious mind, and what possibilities of expression they may awaken in the adult who is free to give them rein. Now, Moore's memory was not harmful and so could survive intact, but every childhood's conflictual experiences remain hidden and locked in darkness, and the key to our understanding of the life that follows is hidden away with them. The Poor Rich Child Sometimes I ask myself whether it will ever be possible for us to grasp the extent of the loneliness and desertion to which we were exposed as children, and hence, intrapsychiatrically, still are exposed as adults. Here I do not mean to speak primarily of cases of obvious desertion by or separation from the parents, though this, of course, can have traumatic results, nor am I thinking of children who were obviously uncared for or totally neglected, and who were always aware of this or at least grew up with the knowledge that it was so. Apart from these extreme cases, there are large numbers of people who suffer from narcissistic disorders who often had sensitive and caring parents from whom they received much encouragement. Yet these people are suffering from severe depressions. They enter analysis in the belief with which they grew up that their childhood was happy and protected. Quite often we are faced here with gifted patients who have been praised and admired for their talents and their achievements. Almost all of these analysins were toilet trained in the first year of their infancy, and many of them at the age of one and a half to five had helped capably to take care of their younger siblings. According to prevailing general attitudes, these people, the pride of their parents, should have had a strong and stable sense of self-assurance. But exactly the opposite is the case. In everything they undertake, they do well and often excellently. They are admired and envied, they are successful wherever they care to be, but all to no avail. Behind all this lurks depression, the feeling of emptiness and self-alienation, and a sense that their life has no meaning. These dark feelings will come to the fore as soon as the drug of grandiosity fails, as soon as they are not on top, not definitely the superstar, or whenever they suddenly get the feeling they failed to live up to some ideal image and measure they feel they must adhere to. Then they are plagued by anxiety or deep feelings of guilt and shame. What are the reasons for such narcissistic disturbances in these gifted people? In the very first interview, they will let the listener know that they have had understanding parents, or at least one such, and if they ever lacked understanding, they felt that the fault lay with them and with their inability to express themselves appropriately. They recount their earliest memories without any sympathy for the child they once were, and this is the more striking since these patients not only have a pronounced introspective ability, but are also able to empathize well with other people. Their relationship to their own childhood's emotional world, however, is characterized by lack of respect, compulsion to control, manipulation, and a demand for achievement. Very often they show disdain and irony, even derision and cynicism. In general, there is a complete absence of real emotional understanding or serious appreciation of their own childhood vicissitudes, and no conception of their true needs, beyond the need for achievement. The internalization of the original drama has been so complete that the illusion of a good childhood can be maintained. In order to lay the groundwork for a description of these patients' psychic climate, 
I first will formulate some basic assumptions which will provide us with a starting point and are close to the work of D.W. Winnicott, Margaret Mahler, and Heinz Kohut. The child has a primary need to be regarded and respected as the person he really is at any given time and as the center, the central actor, in his own activity. In contradistinction to drive wishes, we are speaking here of a need that is narcissistic but nevertheless legitimate, and whose fulfillment is essential for the development of a healthy self-esteem. When we speak here of the person he really is at any given time, we mean emotions, sensations, and their expression from the first day onward. Mahler, 1968, writes, The infant's inner sensations form the core of the self. They appear to regain the central, the crystallization point of the feeling of self around which a sense of identity will become established. In an atmosphere of respect and tolerance for his feelings, the child in the phase of separation will be able to give up symbiosis with the mother and accomplish the steps toward individuation and autonomy. If they are to furnish these prerequisites for a healthy narcissism, the parents themselves ought to have grown up in such an atmosphere. Parents who did not experience this climate as children are themselves narcissistically deprived. Throughout their lives, they are looking for what their own parents could not give them at the correct time the presence of a person who is completely aware of them and takes them seriously, who admires them and follows them. This search, of course, can never succeed fully since it relates to a situation that belongs irrevocably to the past, namely to the time when the self was first being formed. Nevertheless, a person with this unsatisfied and unconscious, because repressed, need is compelled to attempt its gratification through substitute means. The most appropriate objects for gratification are a parent's own children. A newborn baby is completely dependent on his parents, and since their caring is essential for his existence, he does all he can to avoid losing them. From the very first day forward, he will muster all his resources to this end, like a small plant that turns toward the sun in order to survive. Miller, 1971. So far, I have stayed in the realm of more or less well-known facts. The following thoughts are derived more from observations made in the course of analyses I have conducted or supervised, and also from interviews with candidates for the psychoanalytic profession. In my work with all these people, I found that every one of them has a childhood history that seems significant to me. There was a mother. By mother, I here understand the person closest to the child during the first years of life. This need not be the biological mother, nor even a woman. In the course of the past 20 years, quite often the fathers have assumed this mothering function. So there was a mother, who at the core was emotionally insecure, and who depended for her narcissistic equilibrium on the child behaving or acting in a particular way. This mother was able to hide her insecurity from the child and from everyone else behind a hard authoritarian and even totalitarian facade. This child has an amazing ability to perceive and respond intuitively, that is, unconsciously, to this need of the mother, or of both parents, for him to take on the role that had unconsciously been assigned for him. This role secured, quote, love for the child, that is, his parents' narcissistic cathexis. He could sense that he was needed, and this, he felt, guaranteed him a measure of existential security. This ability is then extended and perfected. Later, these children not only become mothers, confidants, comforters, advisors, supporters of their own mothers, but also take over the responsibility for their siblings and eventually develop a special sensitivity to unconscious signals manifesting the needs of others. No wonder that they often choose the psychoanalytic profession later on. Who else without this previous history would muster his efficient interest to spend the whole day trying to discover what is happening in the other person's unconscious? But the development and perfecting of this differentiated sensorium, which once assisted the child in surviving and now enables the adult to pursue this strange profession, also contains the roots of his narcissistic disturbance. The Lost World of Feelings The phenomenology of narcissistic disturbance is well known today. On the basis of my experience, I would think that its ideology is to be found in the infant's early emotional adaptation. In any case, the child's narcissistic needs for respect, echoing, understanding, sympathy, and mirroring suffer a very special fate as a result of this early adaptation. 1. One serious consequence of this early adaptation is the impossibility of consciously experiencing certain feelings of his own, such as jealousy, envy, anger, loneliness, impotence, or anxiety, either in childhood or later in adulthood. This is all the more tragic since we are here concerned with lively people who are especially capable of differentiated feelings. This is noticeable at those times in their analyses when they describe childhood experiences that were free of conflict. Usually these concern experiences with nature, which they could enjoy without hurting the mother or making her feel insecure, without reducing her power or endangering her equilibrium. But it is remarkable how these attentive, lively, and sensitive children who can, for example, remember exactly how they discovered the sunlight and bright grass at the age of four, yet at eight might be unable to, quote, notice anything, 
or to show any curiosity about the pregnant mother, or similarly were not at all jealous of the birth of a sibling. Again, at the age of two, one of them could be left alone while soldiers forced their way into the house and searched it, and she had been good, suffering this quietly and without crying. They have all developed the art of not experiencing feelings, for a child can only experience his feelings when there is somebody there who accepts him fully, understands, and supports him. If that is missing, if the child must risk losing the mother's love, or that of her substitute, then he cannot experience these feelings secretly, just for himself, but fails to experience them at all. But nevertheless, something remains. Throughout their later life, these people unconsciously create situations in which these rudimentary feelings may awaken, but without the original connection ever becoming clear. The point of this play, as Jürgen Habermas 1970 called it, can only be deciphered in analysis, when the analyst joins the cast and the intense emotions experienced in the analysis are successfully related to their original situation. Freud described this in 1914 in his work Recollection, Repetition, and Working Through. Take for an example the feeling of being abandoned, not that of the adult who feels lonely and therefore takes tablets or drugs, goes to the movies, visits friends, or telephones unnecessarily in order to bridge the gap somehow. No, I mean the original feeling in the small infant, who had none of these chances of distraction and whose communication, verbal or preverbal, did not reach the mother. This was not the case because his mother was bad, but because she herself was narcissistically deprived, dependent on a specific echo from the child that was so essential to her, for she herself was a child in search of an object that could be available to her. However paradoxical this may seem, a child is at the mother's disposal. A child cannot run away from her as her own mother once did. A child can be so brought up that it becomes what she wants it to be. A child can be made to show respect, she can impose her own feelings on him, see herself mirrored in his love and admiration, and feel strong in his presence. But when he becomes too much, she can abandon that child to a stranger. The mother can feel herself the center of attention, for her child's eyes follow her everywhere. When a woman had to suppress and repress all of these needs in relation to her own mother, they rise from the depth of her unconscious and seek gratification through her own child. However well educated and how well intentioned she may be, and however much she is aware of what a child needs. The child feels this clearly, and very soon forgoes the expression of his own distress. Later, when these feelings of being deserted begin to emerge in the analysis of the adult, they are accompanied by such intensity of pain and despair that it is quite clear that these people could not have survived in so much pain. That would only have been possible in an empathetic, attentive environment, and this they lacked. The same holds true for emotions connected with the Oedipal drama and the entire drive development of the child. All this had to be warded off, but to say that it was absent would be a denial of the empirical evidence that we have gained in analysis. Several sorts of mechanisms can be recognized in the defense against early feelings of abandonment. In addition to simple denial, there is reversal. I am breaking down under the constant responsibility because the others need me ceaselessly. Changing passive suffering into active behavior. I must quit women as soon as I feel that I am essential to them. Projection onto other objects and interjection of the threat of loss of love. I must always be good and measure up to the norm. Then there is no risk. I constantly feel that the demands are too great, but I cannot change that. I must always achieve more than others. Intellectualization is very commonly met, since it is a defense mechanism of great reliability. All these defense mechanisms are accompanied by repression of the original situation and the emotions belonging to it, which can only come to the surface after years of analysis. 2. Accommodation to parental needs often, but not always, leads to the as-if personality. Winnicott has described it as the false self. This person develops in such a way that he reveals only what is expected of him, and fuses so completely with what he reveals that, until he comes to analysis, one could scarcely have guessed how much more there is to him behind this masked view of himself, Habermas, 1970. He cannot develop and differentiate his true self because he is unable to live it. It remains in a state of non-communication, as Winnicott has expressed it, Understandably, these patients complain of a sense of emptiness, futility, or homelessness, for the emptiness is real. A process of emptying, impoverishment, and partial killing of his potential actually took place when all that was alive and spontaneous in him was cut off. In childhood, these people have often had dreams in which they experienced themselves as partly dead. I should like to give three examples. My younger siblings are standing on a bridge and throw a box into the river. I know that I am lying in it dead, and yet I hear my heart beating. At this moment I always wake, a recurrent dream. This dream combines her unconscious aggression, envy and jealousy, against the younger siblings, for whom the patient was always a caring mother, with killing her own feelings, wishes, and demands by means of reaction formation. Another patient dreamed, 
I see a green meadow on which there is a white coffin. I'm afraid that my mother is in it, but I open the lid, and luckily it is not my mother but me. If this patient had been able as a child to express his disappointment with his mother, to experience his rage and anger, he could have stayed alive. But that would have led to the loss of his mother's love, and that for a child is the same as object lost in death. So he killed his anger and with it a part of himself in order to preserve his self-object, the mother. A young girl used to dream, I am lying on my bed, I am dead, my parents are talking and looking at me, but they don't realize that I'm dead. 3. The difficulties inherent in experiencing and developing one's own emotions lead to bond permanence, which prevents individuation, in which both parties have an interest. The parents have found in their child's false self the confirmation they were looking for, a substitute for their own missing structures. The child who has been unable to build up his own structures is first consciously and then unconsciously, through the introject, dependent on his parents. He cannot rely on his own emotions, has not come to experience them through trial and error, has no sense of his own real needs, and is alienated from himself to the highest degree. Under these circumstances, he cannot separate from his parents, and even as an adult, he is still dependent on affirmation from his partner, from groups, or especially from his own children. The heirs of the parents are the introjects, from whom the true self must remain concealed, and so loneliness in the parental home is later followed by isolation within the self. Narcissistic cathexis of her child by the mother does not exclude emotional devotion. On the contrary, she loves the child as her self-object excessively, though not in the manner that he needs, and always on the condition that he presents his false self. This is no obstacle to the development of intellectual abilities, but it is one to the unfolding of an authentic emotional life. In Search of the True Self How can psychoanalysis be of help here? The harmony depicted in Kathchen von Heilbronn, Heinrich von Kleist's romantic heroine in the drama of the same name, 1810, is probably only possible in fantasy, and particularly understandable arising from the longing of such a narcissistically tormented person as Cleist. The simplicity of Shakespeare's Falstaff, of whom Freud is reported to have said that he embodied the sadness of healthy narcissism, is neither possible nor desirable for these patients. The paradise of preambivalent harmony, for which so many patients hope, is unattainable. But the experience of one's own truth, and the post-ambivalent knowledge of it, makes it possible to return to one's own world of feelings at an adult level, without paradise, but with the ability to mourn. It is one of the turning points in analysis when the narcissistically disturbed patient comes to the emotional insight that all the love he has captured with so much effort and self-denial was not meant for him as he really was, that the admiration for his beauty and achievements was aimed at this beauty and these achievements, and not at the child himself. In analysis, the small and lonely child that is hidden behind his achievements wakes up and asks, What would have happened if I had appeared before you, bad, ugly, angry, jealous, lazy, dirty, smelly? Where would your love have been then? And I was all these things as well. Does it mean that it was not really me whom you love, but only what I pretended to be? The well-behaved, reliable, empathetic, understanding, and convenient child, who in fact was never a child at all? What became of my childhood? Have I not been cheated out of it? I can never return to it. I can never make up for it. From the beginning I have been a little adult. My abilities, were they simply misused? These questions are accompanied by much grief and pain, but the result always is a new authority that is being established in the analysand, like a heritage of the mother who never existed, a new empathy with his own fate, born out of mourning. At this point, one patient dreamed that he killed a child thirty years ago, and no one had helped him to save it. Thirty years earlier, precisely in the Oedipal phase, those around him had noticed that this child became totally reserved, polite, and good, and no longer showed any emotional reactions. Now the patient does not make light of manifestations of self anymore, does not laugh or jeer at them, even if he still unconsciously passes them over or ignores them, in the same subtle way that his parents dealt with the child before he had any words to express his needs. Then fantasies of grandeur will be revived too, which had been deprecated and so split off. And now we can see their relation to the frustrated and repressed needs for attention, respect, understanding, for echoing and mirroring, at the center of these fantasies, there is always a wish that the patient could never have accepted before. For example, I am in the center, my parents are taking notice of me and are ignoring their own wishes. Fantasy, I am the princess attended by my servants. My parents understand when I try to express my feelings and do not laugh at me. Fantasy, I am a famous artist and everyone takes me seriously, even those who don't understand me. My parents are rich in talents and courage and not dependent on my achievements. They do not need my comfort nor my smile. They are king and queen. This would mean for the child, I can be sad or happy whenever anything makes me sad or happy, I don't have to look cheerful for someone else, and I don't have to suppress my distress or anxiety to fit other people's needs. I can be angry and no one will die or get a headache because of it. 
I can rage and smash things without losing my parents. In D.W. Winnicott's words, I can destroy the object and it will still survive, 1969. Once these grandiose fantasies, often accompanied by obsessional or perverse phenomena, have been experienced and understood as the alienated form of these real and legitimate needs, the split can be overcome and integration can follow. What is the chronological course? 1. In the majority of cases, it is not difficult to point out to the patient early in his analysis the way he has dealt with his feelings and needs, and that this was a question of survival for him. It is a great relief to him that things he was accustomed to choke off can be recognized and taken seriously. The psychoanalyst can use the material the patient presents to show him how he treats his feelings with ridicule and irony, tries to persuade himself they do not exist, belittles them, and either does not become aware of them at all, or only after several days when they have already passed. Gradually, the patient himself realizes how he is forced to look for distraction when he is moved, upset, or sad. When a six-year-old's mother died, his aunt told him, You must be brave, don't cry, now go to your room and play nicely. There are still many situations when he sees himself as other people see him, constantly asking himself what impression he's making, and how he ought to be reacting or what feelings he ought to have. But on the whole, he feels much freer in this initial period, and, thanks to the analyst as his auxiliary ego, he can be more aware of himself when his immediate feelings are experienced within the session and taken seriously. He is very grateful for this possibility, too. 2. This will, of course, change. In addition to this first function, which will continue for a long time, the analyst must take on a second as soon as the transference neurosis has developed, that of being the transference figure. Feelings out of various periods of childhood come to the surface then. This is the most difficult stage in analysis, when there is most acting out. The patient begins to be articulate and breaks with his former compliant attitudes, but because of his early experience he cannot believe this is possible without mortal danger. The compulsion to repeat leads him to provoke situations where his fear of object loss, rejection, and isolation has a basis in present reality, situations into which he drags the analyst with him, as a rejecting or demanding mother, for example so that afterward he can enjoy the relief of having taken the risk and been true to himself. This can begin quite harmlessly. The patient is surprised by feelings that he would rather not have recognized, but now it is too late. Awareness of his own impulses has already been aroused and there is no going back. Now the analysis must, and also is allowed to, experience himself in a way he had never before thought possible. Whereas this patient had always despised miserliness, he suddenly catches himself reckoning up the two minutes lost to his session through a telephone call. Whereas he had previously never made demands himself, and had always been tireless in fulfilling the demands of others, now he is suddenly furious that his analyst again is going on vacation. Or he is annoyed to see other people waiting outside the consulting room. What can this be? Surely not jealousy. That's an emotion he does not recognize, and yet... What are they doing here? Do others besides me come here? He had never realized that before. At first it is mortifying to see that he is not only good, understanding, tolerant, controlled, and above all adult, for this was always the basis of his self-respect, but another, weightier mortification is added to the first, when this analysis discovers the introjects within himself, and that he has been their prisoner, for his anger, demands, and avarice do not at first appear in a tamed adult form, but in the childish, archaic one in which they were repressed. The patient is horrified when he realizes that he is capable of screaming with rage in the same way that he so hated in his father, or that only yesterday he has checked and controlled his child, practically, he says, in my mother's clothes. This revival of the introjects and learning to come to terms with them, with the help of the transference, forms the major part of the analysis. What cannot be recalled is unconsciously reenacted and thus indirectly discovered. The more he is able to admit and experience these early feelings, the stronger and more coherent the patient will feel. This in turn enables him to expose himself to emotions that well up out of his earliest childhood and to experience the helplessness and ambivalence of that period. There is a big difference between having ambivalent feelings towards someone as an adult and, after working back through much of one's previous history, suddenly experiencing oneself as a two-year-old who is being fed by the maid in the kitchen and thinking in despair, why does mother go out every evening? Why does she not take pleasure in me? What is wrong with me that she prefers to go to other people? What can I do to make her stay at home? Just don't cry. Just don't cry. The child could not have thought in these words at the time, but in the session on the couch, this man was both an adult and a two-year-old child, and could cry bitterly. It was not only a cathartic crying, but rather the integration of his earlier longing for his mother, which until now he had always denied. In the following weeks, the patient went through all of the torments of his ambivalence towards his mother, who was a successful pediatrician. Her previously frozen portrait melted into the picture of a woman with lovable aspects, but who had not been able to give her child any continuity in their relationship. I hated these beasts who were constantly sick and always taking my mother away from me. I hated my mother because she preferred being with them to being with me. In the transference, clinging tendencies and feelings of helplessness were mingled with long damned up rage against the love object who had not been available to him. As a result, the patient could rid himself of a perversion that had tormented him for a long time. Its point was now easy to understand. 
His relationships to women lost their marked characteristics of narcissistic cassexis, and his compulsion first to conquer and then to desert them disappeared completely. At this stage in the analysis, the patient experienced his early feelings of helplessness, of anger, and of being at the mercy of the loved object in a manner that he could not previously have remembered. One can only remember what had been consciously experienced, but the emotional world of a child with a narcissistic disturbance is itself the result of a selection, which has eliminated the most important elements. These early feelings, joined with the pain of not being able to understand what is going on that is part of the earliest period of childhood, are then consciously experienced for the first time during analysis. The true self has been in a state of non-communication, as Winnicott said, because it had to be protected. The patient never needs to hide anything else so thoroughly, so deeply, and for so long a time as he has hidden his true self. Thus it is like a miracle each time to see how much individuality has survived behind such dissimulation, denial, and self-alienation, and can reappear as soon as the work of mourning brings freedom from the introjects. Nevertheless, it would be wrong to understand Winnicott's words to mean that there is a fully developed true self hidden behind the false self. If that were so, there would be no narcissistic disturbance, but a conscious self-protection. The important point is that the child does not know what he is hiding. A patient expressed this in the following way. I lived in a glass house into which my mother could look at any time. In a glass house, however, you cannot conceal anything without giving yourself away, except by hiding it under the ground, and then you cannot see it yourself either. An adult can only be fully aware of his feelings if he has internalized an affectionate and empathic self-object. People with narcissistic disturbances are missing out on this. Therefore, they are never overtaken by unexpected emotions, and will only admit those feelings that are accepted and approved by their inner censor, which is their parent's heir. Depression and a sense of inner emptiness is the price they must pay for this control. To return to Winnicott's concept, the true self cannot communicate because it has remained unconscious and therefore undeveloped in its inner prison. The company of prison boarders does not encourage lively development. It is only after it is liberated in analysis that the self begins to be articulate, to grow, and to develop its creativity. Where there had only been fearful emptiness or equally frightening grandiose fantasies, there now is unfolding an unexpected wealth of vitality. This is not a homecoming, since this home had never before existed. It is the discovery of home. 3. The phase of separation begins when the analysand has reliably acquired the ability to mourn and can face feelings from his childhood without the constant need for the analyst. The Psychoanalyst's Situation It is often said that psychoanalysts suffer from a narcissistic disturbance. The purpose of my presentation so far has been to clarify the extent to which this can be confirmed not only inductively based on experience, but also deductively from the type of talent that is needed by an analyst. His sensibility, his empathy, his intense and differentiated emotional responsiveness, and his unusually powerful antennae seem to predestine him as a child to be used, if not misused, by people with intense narcissistic needs. Of course, there is the theoretical possibility that a child who was gifted in this way could have had parents who did not need to misuse him. Parents who saw him as he really was, understood him, and tolerated and respected his feelings. Such a child would develop a healthy narcissism. One could hardly expect, however, one, that he would later take up the profession of psychoanalysis, two, that he would cultivate and develop his sensorium for others to the same extent as those who were narcissistically used, three, that he would ever be able to understand sufficiently, on the basis of experience, what it means to have killed oneself. I believe, then, that it is no less our fate than our talent that enables us to exercise the profession of psychoanalyst, after being given the chance, through our training analysis, to live with the reality of our past, and to give up the most flagrant of our illusions. This means tolerating the knowledge that, to avoid losing the object love, the love of the first object, we were compelled to gratify our parents' unconscious needs at the cost of our own self-realization. It also means being able to experience the rebellion and mourning aroused by the fact that our parents were not available to fulfill our primary narcissistic needs. If we have never lived through this despair and the resulting narcissistic rage, and have therefore never been able to work through it, we can be in danger of transferring this situation, which then would have remained unconscious, onto our patients. It would not be surprising if our unconscious anger should find no better way than once more to make use of a weaker person and to make him take the unavailable parent's place. This can be done most easily with one's own children, or with patients, who at times are as dependent on their analysts as children are on their parents. An analytically talented patient, one with antennae for his analyst's unconscious, reacts promptly. He will present the analyst with a complete picture of his, quote, Oedipus complex, with all the affects and insights are required. The only disadvantage is that we then have to deal with an as-if Oedipus complex, a defense against the patient's real feelings. Not until he has been given time and space to develop his true self, to let it speak and to listen to it, can the unknown, unique history of his Oedipal vicissitudes be unfolded, affecting both patient and analyst because it is the painfully discovered truth. 
This is true not only for the Oedipus complex, but for everything. Such an analysis will quickly feel himself autonomous, and he will react accordingly if he senses that it is important to his analysts to have analysis who soon become autonomous and behave with self-confidence. He can do that, he can do anything that is expected of him, but as this autonomy is not genuine, it soon ends in depression. True autonomy is preceded by the experience of being dependent, first on partners, then on the analyst, and finally on the primary objects. True liberation can only be found beyond the deep ambivalence of infantile dependence. The patient satisfies his analyst's narcissistic wish for approval, echo, understanding, and for being taken seriously when he presents material that fits his analyst's knowledge, concepts, and skills, and therefore also his expectations. In this way, the analyst exercises the same sort of unconscious manipulation as that to which he was exposed as a child. He has, of course, long since seen through conscious manipulation and freed himself from it. He also has learned to say no and to stand up for his own opinions and carry them through. But a child can never see through unconscious manipulation. It's like the air he breathes. He knows no other, and it appears to him to be the only normal possibility. One analysis, for example, could never be sad nor cry as a child without being aware that he was making his beloved mother unhappy and very unsure of herself, for a cheerfulness was the trait that had saved her life in her own childhood. Her children's tears threatened her equilibrium. The extremely sensitive child felt within himself a whole abyss warded off by his mother, who had been in a concentration camp as a child, but had never spoken about it. Not until her son was grown up and could ask her questions did she tell him that she was one of 80 children who had to watch their parents going into the gas chambers and not one child had cried. Throughout his childhood, this son had tried to be cheerful and could only express his true self, his feelings, and inklings only in obsessive perversions, which seemed alien, shameful, and incomprehensible to him until he came into analysis. The shaming nature of perversions and obsessional behavior can often be understood as the interjection of the parent's shocked reaction to their child's natural, instinctual behavior. Normal sexual fulfillment no longer evokes horror in the interjected mother, as it formerly did in the real one, but perverted behavior is sure to do so. One is totally defenseless against this sort of manipulation in childhood. The tragedy is that the parents, too, have no defense against it, since they do not know what is happening, and even if they have some inkling, can do nothing to change it. Their conscious aims are genuinely quite different, even giving every possible support, but unconsciously the parents' childhood tragedy is continued in their children. For the tragic aspects of psychoanalysis, see Roy Schaefer, 1972. Another example may illustrate this more clearly. A father who as a child had often been frightened by the anxiety attacks of his periodically schizophrenic mother, without ever receiving an explanation, enjoyed telling his beloved small daughter gruesome stories. He laughed at her fears, and afterward always comforted her with the words, but it's only a made-up story, you don't need to be scared, you're here with me. In this way he could manipulate his child's fear and have the feeling of being strong. His conscious wish was to give the child something valuable that he himself had been deprived of, namely protection, comfort, and explanations. But what he unconsciously handed on was his own childhood fear, the expectation of disaster, and the unanswered question, also from his childhood, why does the person whom I love and who loves me frighten me so much? Probably everybody has a more or less concealed inner chamber that he hides even from himself, and in which the props of his childhood drama are to be found. These props may be his secret delusion, a secret perversion, or quite simply the unmastered aspects of his childhood suffering. The only ones who will certainly gain entrance to his hidden chamber are his children. With them, new life comes into it, and the drama is continued. All the same, when he was a child, he hardly had a chance to play freely with these props, his role merged into his life, and so he could not take any memories of such playing with him for later, except through unconscious repetition and analysis, when he might begin to ask questions about his role. The props may well have frightened him at times. Understandably, he could not connect them with the familiar figures of father or mother, for after all, they represented the split-off, unintegrated part of the parents. But the child cannot experience this contradiction consciously. He simply accepts everything, and at the most, develops symptoms. Then in analysis, the feelings emerge, feelings of terror, of despair and rebellion, of mistrust, but, if it is possible to reconstruct the parents' vicissitudes, also of compassion and reconciliation. Can it be an accident that Heinrich Pestalozzi, who was fatherless from his sixth year onward and emotionally neglected despite the presence of his mother and of a nurse, had the idea of bringing up his only son according to Rousseau's methods, although he was capable, on the other hand, of giving orphan children genuine warmth and fatherliness? This son finally grew up neglected, as a ten-year-old was considered to be mentally defective, caused Pestalozzi much pain and guilt feelings, and then died at the age of thirty. It was also Pestalozzi who was reputed to have said, you can drive the devil out of your garden, but you will find him again in the garden of your son. In psychoanalytic terms, one could say that it is the split-off and unintegrated parts of his parents that have been interjected by the child. Footnote. In H. Gans, 1966, we can read, Jacobli is to have a garden of his own to look after, set plants in, 
collecting chrysalis and beetles in an orderly, exact, and industrious manner. What a bridle for indolence and wildness. Jacobli is now three and a half. It would be about a year later, on the occasion of his father's name day, that Jacobli, who could not write, half singing, half murmuring, daily dictated to his mother, I wish, my dear papa, that you should see a lot more, and I thank you a hundred thousand times for your goodness, that you have brought me up so joyfully and lovingly. Now I shall speak from my heart. It makes me terribly happy if you can say, I have brought my son up to happiness. I am his joy and his happiness. Then shall I first give thanks for what you have done in my life. Concluding Remarks the more insight one gains into the unintentional and unconscious manipulation of children by their parents, the fewer illusions one has about the possibility of changing the world or of prophylaxis against neurosis. It seems to me that if we can do anything at all it is to work through our narcissistic problems and reintegrate our split-off aspects to such an extent that we no longer have any need to manipulate our patients according to our theories but can allow them to become what they really are. Only after painfully experiencing and accepting our own truth can we be relatively free from the hope that we might still find an understanding empathetic mother, perhaps in a patient, who then would be at our disposal. This temptation should not be underestimated. Our own mother seldom or never listened to us with such rapt attention as our patients usually do, and she never revealed her inner world to us so clearly and honestly as our patients do at times. However, the never-ending work of mourning can help us not to lapse into this illusion. A mother such as we once urgently needed, empathetic and open, understanding and understandable, available and usable, transparent, clear, without unintelligible contradictions, such a mother was never ours, indeed she could not exist. For every mother carries with her a bit of her unmastered past, which she unconsciously hands on to her child. Each mother can only react empathetically to the extent that she has become free of her own childhood, and she is forced to react without empathy to the extent that, by denying the vicissitudes of her early life, she wears invisible chains. But what does exist are children like this, intelligent, alert, attentive, extremely sensitive, and, because they are completely attuned to her well-being, entirely at the mother's disposal and ready for her use. Above all, they are transparent, clear, reliable, and easy to manipulate, as long as their true self, their emotional world, remains in the cellar of the transparent house in which they have to live, sometimes until puberty or until they come to analysis, and very often until they have become parents themselves. In Alphonse Daudet's uh, Lettres de Montmolon, I have found a story that may sound rather bizarre, but nevertheless has much in common with what I have presented here. I shall summarize the story briefly. Once upon a time there was a child who had a golden brain. His parents only discovered this by chance when he injured his head and gold instead of blood flowed out. They then began to look after him carefully and would not let him play with other children for fear of being robbed. When the boy was grown up and wanted to go out into the world, his mother said, We've done so much for you, we ought to be able to share your wealth. Then her son took a large piece of gold out of his brain and gave it to his mother. He lived in great style with a friend who, however, robbed him one night and ran away. After that, the man resolved to guard his secret and go out to work, because his reserves were visibly dwindling. One day he fell in love with a beautiful girl who loved him too, but no more than the beautiful clothes he gave her so lavishly. He married her and was very happy, but after two years she died, and he spent the rest of his wealth on her funeral, which had to be splendid. Once, as he was creeping through the streets, weak, poor, and unhappy, he saw a beautiful little pair of boots that would just have done for his wife. He forgot that she was dead, perhaps because his emptied brain no longer worked, and entered the shop to buy the boots. But in that very moment he fell, and the shopkeeper saw a dead man lying on the ground. Dade, who was to die from an illness of the spinal cord, wrote below the end of the story. This story sounds as though it were invented, but it is true from beginning to end. There are people who have to pay for the smallest things in life with their very substance in their spinal cord. That is a constantly recurring pain, and then when they are tired of suffering... Dot, dot, dot. Does not mother love belong to the smallest but also indispensable things in life, for which many people paradoxically have to pay by giving up their living selves?